sitting in a chair for so long. So, um, cool. So next up, we have Priya Johnson. Um, she's the political coordinator for the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Um, and she's gonna be talking about what a feminist economy looks like. Um, so uh, Priya joined the GGJ as, um, as political coordinator in January 2017. Um, after a range of international work, she spent a few years doing youth organizing um, for Youth United for Change in Philadelphia. And right now, hmm? yeah. and right now she's uh, currently rooted in her hometown of Atlanta. Um, so everybody give it up for Priya. Hey, y'all. Can you hear me? Yes, you can hear me. What's going on? Um, wow, it really is bright and hot up here. Um, it's a little sparse out there, and I was wondering if people would mind maybe moving a little closer. Um, I'm going to feed off of your energy, so if people don't mind, if y'all are in the back, if you don't mind just moving a little closer, that would be great. Thank you. So while they're moving, I'll do the introductory bits. Um, like Mo said, my name is Priya Johnson, and I'm the political coordinator at Grassroots Global Justice. We are a national alliance of US grassroots organizing groups um, working to build power in frontline communities. We focus mainly on advancing grassroots feminism, climate justice, anti-militarism, and of course, building a people's economy. And to all of that, we bring a strong commitment to grassroots internationalism. Um, so building real solidarity across borders. In the past few years, we've been bringing our members and allies together through feminist organizing schools to discuss power and patriarchy, gender and sexuality, capitalism, feminism, and how to use all of that theoretical and historical understanding to build power toward a feminist future. For today, I'm gonna try and boil all of that down to five key ideas for y'all to take home. So, I've been asked to talk to you all about feminist economics, and we'll get there. But before we go any further, we gotta set a little bit of context. So Trump is president, and a global right wing is finding new ways to restrict the bodies and hearts of all of us, but in particular, women of color and LGBTQ people. Um, a pussy-grabbing misogynist and his followers are leading us toward austerity, expanding militarization inside and outside of our borders, and now even beyond into space, apparently. Um, they're ripping children away from their parents. Sexual assault has become expected background noise of a daily news cycle. Our bodies and our natural world are being commodified and exploited daily in the name of profit. I say all of this not to depress you, but just to give us a sobering reality check. To say that we have to call out patriarchy, particularly given the urgency of the moment. And we're doing that, right? Yes? Maybe? <laughs> so make some noise if in the past two years you have um, lent your support or showed up to a women's march. Okay? All right? Make some noise if you identify as a feminist. All right, and lastly, this one's a little tricky. Make some noise if you identify as a grassroots feminist. All right, not too bad, not too bad. All right, so it's amazing. Feminism is here. Um, whether your feminist icons are Gloria Steinem or Audre Lorde, Beyonce or Cardi B, Feminism is experiencing a much needed resurgence. Feminism was one of the most looked up words of 2017. But the first thing, oops, the first thing that I want us to um, remember is that feminism and the theory, feminism as a theory and ideology is as powerful as it is diverse. So it's shape shifted and meant many different things to many different people in many different eras. In many cases, feminist leaders have actually emphasized gender oppression to the point of excluding the people whose voices and experiences should have actually been centered, right? So the voices and experiences of indigenous, black, and other women of color, and the voices of our LGBTQ family. So while I unfortunately don't have the time to go through all the twists and turns of feminist history, what I wanna make clear is our articulation as GGJ. 
So at GDJ, we talk about grassroots feminism. What do we mean when we say grassroots feminism? Grassroots feminism is led by women of color, LGBTQ, poor and working class people, all of whom understand that their oppression is rooted in patriarchy and its connections to capitalism, colonialism, white supremacy, transphobia, and homophobia. That the liberation of women is bound to the liberation of all oppressed peoples. Grassroots feminism emphasizes that patriarchy is a system that needs to be dismantled because just locking up perpetrators is not enough and doesn't address root causes. It insists on intersections and overlaps between systems of oppression because racism, capitalism, and patriarchy need one another to survive. It supports the grassroots leadership of women of color and LGBTQ people it pushes beyond representation because it's not enough to elect a woman to office or to push her up a corporate ladder. It celebrates and honors transgender and gender non-conforming people and rejects the construct of a gender binary. It builds solidarity with global resistance because nobody's free until all of us are free. So we really want to take advantage of this current moment and the momentum um, and excitement and reclaim feminism for the grassroots. So capitalism and patriarchy. Now, if you've given up your weekend to be here at Common Bound, chances are that you already believe that capitalism sucks. Is that a fair assessment? Yes? Okay. Or at least you believe that the economy that we live in is unjust. A few of you may believe that it's broken, that it's not meeting its full potential, and that in falling short is leaving behind um, low-income communities of color. Most of you, myself included, probably believe that American capitalism is not broken, that it's a well-oiled and fully functioning machine, a machine that doesn't just catch frontline communities in the crossfire incidentally, but instead sustains itself by systematically targeting and exploiting them. Capitalism actually needs patriarchy and racism to survive. It's how millions of jail cells get filled, toilets get cleaned, burgers get flipped, and one man can make millions of dollars off someone else's blood, sweat, and tears, right? The development of the US and its economy was based on the genocide of indigenous people, the theft of land, and the enslavement of Africans. Black people in particular were dehumanized and commodified in the interest of advancing and protecting the capital of white elites. This racialized economy built on a foundation of patriarchy, and particular the gender division of labor and property relationships of the feudal era, which I'll save for another day. <laughs> While we know that the connection between capitalism and patriarchy goes beyond disproportionate impact, the two systems are woven together, it's still important to recognize that today, capitalism harms women of color first and worst. Women are still paid only 79 cents to the dollar as compared to men. But for black women and Latina women, that's 60, 60 cents and 55 cents, respectively. Native American women have the highest poverty rate at 28%. 15% of transgender people make less than $10,000 a year. That's four times the poverty rate of non-trans people. But beyond these statistics, as the state withdraws from social services, it increases financial pressure on families and increases the amount of care work needed, often carried by women and by femmes. And then we have to remember that this beast of capitalism has no borders, right? So under neoliberal global capitalism, there's an international division of labor. After waves of anti-colonial revolution, industrialized nations needed to keep production costs low in order to fuel their never-ending appetite for growth. So they moved production. They moved production to the newly liberated places they were previously extracting raw materials from. And people in poverty in those places, and that, let's remember that poverty is a result of colonialism, people in poverty in those places were desperate. Um, to feed their families, they're forced to work under higher risk for lower wages. Capitalist elites in the West are able to fuel their growth on the exploitation largely of women in the global South. So this picture, the women in this picture work in a garment factory in Mauritius, an island in the Indian Ocean. They work for the equivalent of a dollar a day. I'm not sure if y'all can see the text on that shirt that they've, that they've made. Um, it says, this is what a feminist looks like. 
The shirt costs $70, which is absurd in and of itself, right? <laughs> but imagine these women would have to work two weeks to even afford the shirt that they're making. So it's a particularly gross commodification of feminism that really makes clear the sometimes insidious connections between capitalism and patriarchy. So, in order to build grassroots feminism, we must recognize the intersections and challenge racialized and gendered capitalism. This brings us to feminist economics. So feminist economics challenges the idea that feminism is limited to the personal, the interpersonal, and the social spheres. It looks at how patriarchy shapes the economic system that we live under. So I want to do a little experiment. If everyone could shut your eyes, if you're able and comfortable doing that. Now think of all of the work that you've been socialized to think of as women's work, women's responsibilities. Maybe you think of laundry, childcare, whatever comes to mind. Now think of all the women, femmes, gender non-conforming people, and even male-identified people who carry that work, first in your own lives and then across the globe. Now think about all of that work done by all of those people over the course of a year, and imagine how much it would be worth in total. When you've settled on a dollar amount, open your eyes. So what do people think? Shout out a number. If you're in my session from this morning, don't give it away. <laughs> but if you weren't, shout out a number. Anyone? Just say it. What? OK. Any other guesses? Total, total value. Trillions. All right, all right, trillions. That's actually, that was a very good guess. <laughs> um, so I don't know how they calculated this number, but the UN actually put a number on it. They estimated that if women's unpaid work were properly valued, it would come to $16 trillion, increasing the officially estimated global output by 70%. So again, I don't know how they got that number, um, but what I can tell you is that it's a very large number and that it's an invisible number, right? It's, we, don't, we don't think about these numbers. We don't, we don't think about the labor as work. Um, but these are real people with real stories and real lives and oftentimes other jobs. So this is my mama. Isn't she pretty? <laughs> um, so, and these are my parents. They look super cool. Um, they moved to Canada and then the U.S. from India in the early 70s. You'll notice the bell bottoms there. Um, they worked all types of jobs, right, to get on their feet and out of my aunt's house. Um, when they were just starting out, my dad worked the night shift as a security guard, and my mom did administrative work at a hospital. And they both worked super hard to put food on the table in what we would call productive labor, regular wage labor. But my mom, she came home and carried most of the rest of the labor, too, right? That labor that we don't usually think of as work. Um, as many moms do, she did the cleaning, the cooking, the child rearing, the community functions. And though it wasn't seen as work, my mama was carrying the reproductive labor. Reproductive labor is the mental, emotional, uh, and manual work that goes into maintaining people, maintaining people, family, and community on a daily basis. It's unpaid, as we're socialized to understand it as expected, particularly of women. When it is paid, think of home health aid workers or domestic workers, it's undervalued and undercompensated because alternatively, it's free. The irony is that without reproductive labor, the economy would sink. So most of you have probably seen some version of this iceberg before. This one was developed by Maria Mies. And what it shows is that at the tip of the iceberg, well, a small and visible portion of our economy is comprised of capital and wage labor. This is organized and regulated, but a much larger part of the economy is what is unseen, but actually keeping us afloat. The invisible economy is made up of informal work, subsistence work, housework, colonial relations, natural extraction, and more. It is unregulated, unprotected, and uncontracted. Most of this labor is considered as a free good, like nature. A lot of it is also considered illegal work, like street vending or, working, or farm working without proper authorization. But the labor supplied is vital. 
And until we begin to visibilize the entire economy, the whole iceberg, we'll continue sustaining capitalism on the backs of women and femmes, particularly of color and particularly across the global south. So most of us here um, believe in the urgency and possibility of economic alternatives. Is that right? Yes? Y'all don't sound very excited about economic alternatives. Can I hear that again? Yes? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we may have different ideas on the way forward, but hopefully what I've shared so far will push you all to challenge yourselves, your organizations, your communities, to think about how grassroots feminism can and should be part of your, your vision for what a new economy looks like. So I want to say again, um, I know that a number of people have already said this over the past few days, but feminist economics, just like the new economy movement, is not new. Right? And hopefully that's not a surprise to all of you. And if it is, I encourage you to do some more digging. Um, talk to your elders, talk to your community members. You'll learn that many of our communities around the world have been practicing radical economic alternatives for generations. Right? And in some cases, those alternatives have been feminist. Still, there's not an established doctrine or agreed upon principles of feminist economics. So I just want to leave you with three simple ideas that we should bear in mind as we keep building our vision together. And I want to give big shout outs to Maria Poblet from the Grassroots Policy Project for sharing these with me. So a feminist economy is one that, does this look like a feminist economy to y'all? No, right? <laughs> she doesn't live in a feminist economy. And uh, there, I'm going to take questions later. Um, and so there's a, there's, there's a lot more images like that where this came from. Um, and I say that because a feminist economy is one that decommodifies our bodies. A commodity is something that has a price tag, objects that exist to be bought and sold, conquered and controlled for profit. Capitalism turns everything into commodities, from bottled water to yoga to our beaches and everything in between. We are not commodities. We can build an economy that supports our full political participation and our collective human development. And I know that this one, this piece can be tricky for some people because um, the issue of sex work comes to mind. And I just want to say that for myself, I think the real question when it comes to decommodifying the body is about autonomy, right? So if you're making a decision for yourself about your body, that's one thing. But when the system does it for you and uses your body in a way that's um, without your permission and without your power, that's a different question altogether. So is this a feminist economy? No, right? A feminist economy is one that exists in just relationship um, with nature. Treating nature as a commodity, a source of raw materials for capital, endangers the web of relationships that our survival depends on. Like our bodies, Mother Nature too should not be commodified. We can build an economy that supports human life and human development by recognizing our place as part of nature instead of trying to conquer and dominate it. And lastly, um, a feminist economy is one that socializes reproduction. So child care, education, health care, elder care, these are collective social needs, not individual family problems. We can build an economy that takes up our collective needs without exploiting people. So these are just three ideas that we like to uplift, and our members and allies are embracing and exploring them and expanding them. So just really quickly, one example, this is Miami Worker Center, um, based in Miami, obviously. Um, they bring a feminist economic lens to the struggle for fair wages for domestic workers, the majority of whom are women. Their work around a femme agenda emphasizes the importance of care work and reproductive labor and demands fair compensation. This is Mujeres Unidas y Activas in California. They bring a feminist economic lens to the fight for immigrant rights, including demands around a path to citizenship that recognizes the contributions of women's work and women workers and the need to keep families together. And these are our key takeaways. Um, I just want to end by saying people around the country and the world are using the concept of a feminist economy to organize, build power, and to cultivate a collective imagination of a feminist future. Um, and I can't wait to see what y'all come up with. A feminist economy is an economy for all of us. Um, and so I know if people have questions or want to talk about this more, please come find me after. Thanks.